Well, last Sunday, the partners, uh, those who have committed to be partners of Crosspoint, voted on um, the Guardians for this year. And so I thought it'd be good for you to at least know some of the faces of those who are Guardians who attend your service, the service, this 1130 service. So if there's Guardians here in this service, come on up here with me. I know some of you are here. So Beth Sanders, Robin Kelsch, come on up here. Anybody else? I know Scott Skaggs is back here someplace. Scott, come on out. And then there are others that were in the first service. And so um, these are our um, guardians. There's Logan, too. Logan, I'm so glad you're here. And um, Robin is our, one of our newest guardians. And so let's thank them. And Scott, too. Let's thank them for serving this year. And um, I thought that since I was going to call them up here anyhow, wouldn't it be great to have them help us out with something? I mean, it's an easy way to get volunteers, right? And they are excited. They have, been, they have been thinking about this and excited all week. Beth especially has been excited, and so we're glad she is here and willing to stay up here. Don't you want them all to stay up here and help me? Yes. Oh, I was gonna say. Don't let them down. So Myla, we have a high school senior. Myla Downs Perry is coming up here. Myla, would you welcome? She was at prom all night last night. She is here today to help us. Come on up here, Myla. Myla, tell them what you're going to do. You're going to teach us something, right? Okay, so my voice is there you like go. gone, but I'm going to teach them how to floss, but not in their mouth like the dance, okay? <laughs> so you walk us through it. Talk us through it. Okay. All right. So it's all about the, yeah, all I'll about hold the it hand-eye you. coordination and your hips. Okay. So you hands come down like this, and your hips are going to go this way. Yeah. All right. Oh, gosh. Good night. I can't do it. So your hips go one way and your hands go the other. Yeah, that's the problem, right? That's the problem. <laughs> right. Okay. You're right. You got it, Robin. I got some moves. Here. Oh, yeah. There you go. <laughs> do you need some music? Need some music? You need, let's, do a, let's do a test run, just a short one, and then you show us. Come out here up front here. I'm not a guardian. <laughs> I can't dance in here. All right, music. Let's hear the short. Okay. That seems so easy. <laughs> there you go, Beth. You have... Yeah, I can't get the... <laughs> right. Scott and I have a different... <laughs> All right. Okay, this is the real thing now. This is... This was... That was just the warm-up. She really wants us to be able to do this. All right. I can't switch. I can't, I can't switch it, though. <laughs> All right, good. That's good. You guys good? All right, we're good. Awesome. Let's hear it for the Guardians, for Myla. They did awesome. Now, what if I was to tell you that the problem, that the problem that I had, because they did great, the Guardians did great, but the problem that I had was that Mila was trying to teach me a new dance. Like if Mila would have taught us, if I would have said, hey, Mila, come up here, I'm going to teach you a dance. I'm going to teach you a dance from the 80s, then it would have been a problem. Do you believe that? No. Do you believe that if I, the problem was that she tried to teach me a new dance and if I, it was an old dance, I could have done it? Do you believe that? No. No, okay, well, thanks. Thank you. No, not even discussion. You know, there was no hesitation. I don't get that kind of response any other way, but no. Okay, well, you're right. You're right. The problem was not the dance. The problem was the dancer, right? And believe it or not, I believe this is exactly what Paul was trying to talk about. You're like, okay, you've lost your mind. No, I believe the scripture was trying to get us to see that. In fact, I'm convinced that that is what Paul's message throughout the book of Galatians to the church in Galatia was all about. Religion had been in their ear. It had robbed them of the freedom they once knew in Christ. And the reason was is because they had become convinced because of the voice of religion in their ear that the dance was the problem. And because the dance was the problem, the dance was the solution. And Paul was writing against that. And so in Galatians chapter uh, 5, beginning at verse 19, when Paul says, uh, verse 16 rather, when Paul says these words, no, 19 was right, the acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. And when religion, the voice that was distracting the church in Galatia, would have heard Paul say these words, they would have said, right on. That's it. They would say, don't, you don't need to hear anything else. Just hear these, this list. And you will hear, don't dance the dirty dance, right? Sexual immorality, hatred, idolatry. All, don't dance that anymore. Instead, dance according to the Spirit. Dance this new dance, love, joy, peace, patience, and kindness. And the more you do the good dance and the less you do the bad dance, then that's what this whole faith thing is all about. But the problem, Paul says, is not the dance. It's not that the dance doesn't matter. There is a bad dance. There is a good dance. It doesn't, it's not that it doesn't matter. But it's not the point. In fact, if you think the dance of your faith is the point, whether you're doing more of the good dance or more of the bad dance, if that's the point, then Paul says you've missed a greater problem. He describes it in verse 16. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. So that you are not to do, so that you do not do what you want to do. And so Paul is saying, listen, the problem's not the dance. There is a greater problem going on. There is a greater struggle. And I think if we're honest, we have all felt this tension in us. There is like this two different entities have asked us to dance. The sinful nature has said, hey, will you dance with me? And the Holy Spirit has come and said, hey, will you dance with me? And now we're like the rope in a tug of war. And we have this battle, this conflict that's constantly going on, raging, trying to see which dance we're going to dance more of on any given day. And so Paul says to them, listen, religion wants you to believe that dance is the point. Because then it makes it all about you. And if you do less of this dance and more of this dance, you'll be fine. Then you'll be free. Then you'll inherit the kingdom of heaven. The truth is, what religion doesn't tell you is that it's creating bondage on you. Because when the dance is the point of your faith, am I doing the bad dance or am I doing the good dance? If that is the point of your faith, then what it produces is not freedom, but either self-defeat or self-righteousness. And there's no freedom in either of those. I think many of us know, many of us know what it's like to be, think that faith is about the dance. And so I just have to, I have to do the good dance. Oh, I want to do the good dance so bad. Man, I want to do, I got I to gotta quit doing that bad dance. I know where that leads. I know what that's nice. I know that God's not happy with that. I got to quit doing that dance and start doing the good dance. And it's all good and fine when I'm able to do the good dance. But the moment my willpower breaks, the moment my self-discipline collapses in on itself, the moment I fall flat on my face and I'm back doing the sinful nature dance again, then all of a sudden I'm living in self-defeat. Oh, and I start beating myself up. And you know what I do when I beat myself up? I start withdrawing from all of you. I pull back from worship. I pull back from my small group. I pull back from reading the Bible. I pull back from praying. Because anything like that reminds me of how much I've messed up of how much I haven't been dancing the right dance. And so my nature, my natural instinct is, when it's all about the dance, is I'm going to dance back here for a while because you don't want to see me do this dirty dance. Right? And so I withdraw until finally I start to inch my way forward and I start to pull myself up by my own bootstraps and I start to feel a little bit better about things. And then finally I let somebody in the church reach out to me and they pull me in and they love on me. And look, they're not judging me. They don't all hate me. They haven't, uh, they're, you know, they haven't shunned me or anything. And then I come back and oh my goodness, now I'm worshiping again. And, but then what happens is I just get into this cycle. The cycle of dancing, trying really hard to dance really good for a while until I fall flat on my face and then I live in self-defeat. I pull away and it just round and round it goes. Anybody know what that? I know what that's like. Anybody else? I know what that's like. And I can tell you it is awful. It is awful. And it's frustrating. And it is discouraging. And faith, when it's about the dance like that, becomes this it, it's bondage. And we mean well. We just want to dance a better dance. But Paul's saying, that's where you're missing it. The point isn't the dance. 
If you think it's a dance, you'll live in self-defeat or you'll live in self-righteousness. I, w- I was reading over this list that Paul gives of the bad dance, you know, and I, I counted them up, and I can tell you with honesty, complete honesty, as far as I can tell, that there are three of them that I have never done. Now, that's not so good, considering how long that list is, but there's three that I... Wouldn't you like to know which three? <laughs> right? There's three that I haven't done. That means, wouldn't you like to know? Because then you could figure out which ones I have done, right? You know, and that's what self-righteousness does. Self-righteousness does its best to dance the good dance, but deep down it knows. Now, no matter how good of a dance it can dance in its own willpower, in its own strength, in your own understanding, there's still some other dances you're doing that you hope nobody finds out about. And so the way self-righteousness works in the religion world is if I can just dance more good dances than bad dances, it all kind of equals out. And especially if I can dance dances that you can't dance, then it's even better. Because then if I can find someone who, has say, who says, uh, actually, I've done five, there's, there's, only, there's five that I haven't done, or there's one I haven't done, or there's, I've not done, I've done them all. If I can find you, God help, thank God for you. If I can find you that's done all of them, even witchcraft and even orgies, if I can find you, then guess what? I can look down and I can feel good. And I can say, like the Pharisees used to pray on the street corners, Jesus said, God, thank you. I'm not as bad a sinner as them. Are you with me? Boy, if you've been around the church any place, if you've ever been around a church any place, you know there's a whole lot of self-righteousness going on. Amen? Yeah, that's right. God help us. And they have, but that's not bondage. That's not freedom either. That's bondage. That is bondage. And so Paul comes along and says to the church in Galatia, don't let this yoke of self-defeat, don't let this yoke of self-righteousness put on you that religion is speaking to you. The point isn't the dance. The dance matters. Don't get me wrong. The dance matters. God's made you for more than dancing that dirty dance. The dance matters, but it's not the point. And if you think it's the point, you'll reduce faith to something less than it is, and you'll miss out on how much greater it is. So what is it? What is the point? Verse 18, Paul says this. He says, but if you are led by the Spirit, You are not under the law. Let me put it this way for us. It is the dancer, not the dance, that makes the difference. So trust the dancing to the Holy Spirit. Let me say it again. It is the dancer, not the dance, that makes the difference. So trust the dancing to the Holy Spirit. You know, if if Mila gave me a month to learn that dance... Because I knew what the dance was. I got online and Googled the floss and found the backpack kid. And I, 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 I learned about the floss. And I got up in my office and I tried to do that stupid dance in the office. <laughs> but I could not do it. Even if, I, if, if I had a month, if I had a year, if I had the rest of my life to try to do that dance, I would never execute it like Mila. Because it's not the dance isn't the problem. The dancer is the problem. And that's what Paul was trying to get the church in Galatia. That's what Paul was trying to get us, the church today, to see. The point is not the dance. The dance matters. Don't get me wrong. But that's not the point. The point is, who is doing the dance in my life? And five times, Paul points to who that person can be in our lives. He points to the one, and guess what? He doesn't say your name, and he doesn't say mine. And that's good news. But five times in the midst of ten verses, not to count how many times he talks about in the whole book of Galatians, he says, this is the other way. He says in verse 16, so I say, walk by the Spirit. Then he goes under, on and says in verse 18, if you are led by the Spirit. And then he goes on and he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is. And then in verse 25, he says it twice. He says, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Paul is pointing all the arrow signs he can in the same direction. Before the list of the bad dance and the good dance, after the list of the bad dance and the good dance, Paul is saying, listen, the dance matters, but it's not the point of your faith. The point of your faith is a relationship. 
with the Spirit. And Jesus suffered and he died and he rose again to give us the gift of the Holy Spirit who is God in us and God with us. I think far too many of us in the church have settled for some God somewhere out there that we pray hears us when we cry out to him. Instead of understanding and receiving and experiencing for ourselves a God who is far, who makes himself up close and personal and moves into us so that this building is not the church, we are. We are his temple. We are his place of dwelling. He loves being in you. And Paul's saying, listen, it's not the dance. It's the dancer that makes the difference. So trust the dancing to the Holy Spirit. We see this over and over again in Scripture. Even in the Old Testament, the prophet Zechariah said, it's not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. Jesus says what's impossible with us humans is possible with God. In other words, God isn't asking us to dance a good dance knowing that we can't dance that dance just to defeat us or to make us be puffed up in ourselves so that we can look down on others. He wants us to say, God, do a dance I can't. And for us to experience the Holy Spirit moving in our lives and the next thing we know, the dance we never thought would let go of us begins to lose its grip. And the dance that we never thought we could ever dance, would we ever have that kind of peace? Would we ever have that kind of joy? We start dancing in freely. But it's not about you. And it's not about the dance. It's about him being allowed to dance in and through you. And I say, how in the world? (laughs) I mean, what does that even mean? How do I live that? And Paul speaks to it in verse 24. He says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And then verse 25, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Two things here. To be crucified. What's it mean to be crucified? I was thinking about that, praying about this this week, studying on this. Crucified, crucified. Okay, something's got to die. What's got to die in us? How do, we, how do we get that sinful nature? How do we let that stuff start to die in us, our passions and desires? How do we kill that off? And I thought, man, no wonder we don't want to do this. This is bloody. This is nasty. This is hurtful. This is painful. I mean, no wonder people aren't signing up saying, crucify me, crucify me. So what does this mean? And I realized that Jesus' crucifixion, yes, it took place on Good Friday on the cross, but he settled the issue on Thursday after the Last Supper in the garden where he prayed, Father, if there's any other way to save the world other than this, then take this cup away from me. But then he prayed this prayer, but not my will, but your will. There's amazing things of God that happen in a person's life that the Spirit is free to do. When we come to a point, and if you follow him long enough, trust me, Jesus will bring you to a point where he says, why don't you finally surrender to me? Call it crucifixion, call it whatever you want, but surrender to me. And you say, what is surrender? It means I come to this point where I say, I can't dance that dance. I can't stop dancing that dance. There's no way for me to get to heaven on my own. There's no way for me to be free on my own. Not my will anymore. Your will. And that opens me. And it makes room on the dance floor for the Holy Spirit to move in me. (laughs) And all the Holy Spirit needed was just a little bit of room. (laughs) Just a little bit of room to start moving, start feel, letting you feel the beat. Next thing you know, the Holy Spirit's doing stuff in you. And I won't try to act it out because that's just going to ruin it, right? <laughs> but the Holy Spirit starts moving. He moves when you open the door and says, not my will, but your will. Yeah, you know, the past, man, there's things we wish we could change. There's things that happen in people's past that isn't God's will. He didn't want that for you, but you lived it. Instead of trying to dance your way to your own freedom, man, it doesn't work. Father, not your will, but my, not my will, but your will for my past. And Lord, you know what all that means and what it could mean for me. Our present, the things that we have to face, the stress that we deal with, the anxiety that is so very real in our culture. Lord, here is my present, not my will, 
That's part of the problem. You see, I'm holding on so desperately, trying to control everything, even though I'm in control of nothing. Not my will, but your will. Lord, the future, there's all kinds of uncertainty. There's all kinds of things to be afraid of. There's all thing, kinds of things to hope for and dream for. But God, I don't know what is best. And so I release the, the need to be responsible for trying to figure all that out. And so not my will, but your will. And it makes room on the dance floor for the Holy Spirit to move in you. But then it's lived out every day. Paul says, learn, he says, uh, since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And the more you open yourself up and you give God permission to say, not my will, but your will, the more you begin to get in tune with this, this inner voice, this inner nudge, if you will, to let you know when you're out of step and when you're in step with the Spirit. And when you're out of step, guess what? You don't You've given his, your will over to him, so you don't have to argue with him. You don't have to justify it, rationalize it. You don't have to run away and hide. You, know? you just say, you know, God, you're right. I know that's, that's out of step with you. And I'm not going to wallow in that, and I'm not going to run to the place I usually run when I do that. Rather, I'm going to stand in your presence, and I'm going to stand up, and I'm going to look up to you, and I'm going to let you dance again. God, forgive me. God, help me. And he does. It doesn't have to be this whole cycle of ordeal that you go through. It's, oh, I'm out of step. Okay, Lord, I'm not going to argue with you. Just get me back in step. There we go. Okay, there it is. That feels better. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, yeah, that's the dance. That's what I like. Yeah, that's the dance. Thank God I didn't have to go run for two miles away from you and then try to run back to you. Lord, Lord I'm just going to pick right back up where I am. And that is what God does. He just gets us back in step. And then other days we know we're in step with him. And it feels so good. And it is so freeing. And it's like hopeful. But, but instead of looking down on others who aren't, aren't, we're like, hey, no, 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 who am I to judge? Because, I, man, if not for him, I can't dance at all. <laughs> and so instead of becoming self-righteous or self-defeated, we are everyone's biggest cheerleader when it comes to their faith. Because we just want them to dance. Remember when um, Seth was a toddler, he's about, he had to be about two years old. And was going to take him sledding for the first time. And he had been down on the little tiny hill with Kimberly, and he had been watching me and Anna, his big sister, two years older, sled down this big hill. In his mind, it looked like a mountain. And he just made up his mind. If she could do it, on it, he could do it. And he was going to do it. And so he came over and says, Dada, you take me? I said, sure, buddy. And so he, you know, he had all of his... Um, his snow pants and everything, and he kind of could walk like this, you know. Have you ever seen a kid do that? You do that to your kids? We do it to ours. You know, we're going to keep them warm. They may not be able to move, but we're going to keep them warm. And so Seth's doing this, and he's kind of inching his way up the hill, and then he falls down. Now he's determined, man. He gets back up, and he goes up a little farther, and then he falls down, and he slides down. And then I pull him back up and get him going again, and then he falls down, and I think, we are never going to get to the top of the hill. <laughs> and so I say, Seth, and he knew. He knew exactly what I was going to say. And he did one of these. You know how your kids do that? I, yeah, I'm ready, Dad. That's all I was looking for, you know. And so you pick up, and I picked him up in my arm, and I got the sled in the other, and we start climbing. And Seth's a talker, man. He's just jabbering. Da, 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 da. I'm like, dear God, I can't breathe, you know. <laughs> Quit talking. So we get up to the top of the hill, and, and, I, and he says, is this? And we get a little farther up, and he says, is this the place, Daddy, where you took Anna? I said, no, buddy. I went high. He said, Go higher, Dada. And so I went higher. He wanted to do it just where his big sister was doing. And he didn't care, and I didn't care what his mom thought. And so we went higher, and we went higher, and we went higher, and we finally got to the spot, and I set him down. And Seth did this. He raised his arms in the air, and he said, I did it, Dada. I made it. And I laughed because I'm sweating, I'm panting, about having a heart attack. He didn't do it. I did it. And yet I laughed. Because I love that he made it, and he did do it. Because had he insisted on standing and climbing and falling and starting all over again, over and over again, guess what? We would have never made it to the top of that hill. So yes, Seth, you did it. And that's what the Holy Spirit wants you and me to experience with him. This real dynamic can't even know how I breathed without it, relationship with him. Because some of us, some of you, some people watching right now, I know of just a few of the hills you have been asked to climb right now. 
And I don't know how you do it. And I hurt for you. And I wish I could just come and just level that thing and just say, there, it's done. You don't have to climb over that anymore. Don't even worry about it. But you have a Holy Spirit. You have God himself. Who's just waiting for you to look up and say, oh, not my will, but your will. I can't do it. He loves to hear you say, I can't do it. Not because he wants you to live in defeat, because he knows he can do for you what you cannot do for yourself. Oh, I can't do it. I cannot climb this. Anybody have a hot hill right now that you just need to say in your spirit, I can't do it, Holy Spirit? Tell him. Experience him picking you up. And then you get there. Because you're going to get there. God's already made up his mind that all, he works all things together for good. He's not going to let this hill defeat you. And then you get there. And all of a sudden, and this is where some of you are, you are standing right on the edge, right on the brink of something awesome, something great. And you, and you can feel it. You can. You can feel it. Something good is coming. God is getting ready to give me the ride of my life. And yet fear is holding you back. And fear is saying, I don't know, because you know what? It was so hard to get up this hill. I don't know if I want to enjoy the ride going down. I just want to stay here for a minute, God. Just leave me here for a minute. I don't know what you're doing. No, trust him. Trust him. Don't, don't let fear hold you back. Don't let the lies of the enemy hold you back. Don't let your past experience hold you back. If if God wants to do something new in your life, then let him have permission to do it because you're going to experience a ride and you're going to be like my son screaming his head off and giggling all the way down, you know? Let him. This is life with the Spirit. This is the dance with the Spirit. This is the difference from religion and faith in Jesus Christ. Religion is about you not dancing that dance and you dancing more of this dance. And it's all about you. And if you don't do it, you're going to hell. But this is about the Spirit. This is about us as people saying, I need a relationship with a God in heaven to come down in me and do for myself what I can. And friends, hell can't hold on to you when you do that. Amen. That's my prayer for you today. In fact, let me pray with you. Heavenly Father God, as we get ready to receive communion, there is no better picture, Jesus, than you gave us of you teaching us how to say, not my will, but your will, and that bread representing your broken, broken body, and that blood representing your life being poured out so that we might have life. And Lord, I hope everybody in this room knows that everyone is welcome to come to your table. Followers of Christ, and even those who would say, you know what, I'm willing to believe, but God help me with my unbelief, <laughs> you come to the table too. And you break off that bread and you dip it in the juice. And as you see his brokenness covered in his blood, may you give him permission to cover your brokenness with his blood. And those of you who feel like you are slipping and sliding, trying to climb up a hill right now, maybe in communion, this will be your time to look up to heaven, hold your arms up and say, Holy Spirit, I need you to carry me this time. And the Holy Spirit will just dance around you, pick you up in his arms. God, will you do that for somebody today? For the one who has the heaviest burden, the one who is discouraged, the one who's online right now, not even with us, but you are there in that apartment or that house. Would you go to them? Would you pick them up today? Would you give them hope today? you give them the courage to say, not my will, but your will. Let go of control and just let you have them. <laughs> and then others, Lord, I'm sure there's somebody here who feels like they have finally made it to the top and they are just on the brink of something. <laughs> and there's possibilities before them and there's good awaiting to them, but that can be a scary place because we don't want to make the wrong choice. <laughs> we don't want to screw this up, God. We got something good. And we can hold on so desperately to the good things you give to us that we end up losing it. Lord, would you help us to, again, say, not my will, your will, even in the good, not my will, your will. And hop on that sled and see where you take us. See what new dance moves you're going to teach us. <laughs> and then, Lord, as we receive this communion, we get to hear 
uh, a song that Bobby wrote. Thank you for what you're doing in Bobby's life. And thank you for letting him be willing to share kind of a, a piece of his story, of his testimony through this song. We know, I believe, it's going to speak to somebody today as well. And so we're ready, Lord. Holy Spirit, help us dance right now. In Jesus' name.